I am so excited to introduce our guest, Brian Godfrey. After earning a master's in social work from the University of Pennsylvania and working for four years as an outpatient psychotherapist in Northern Philadelphia, Brian continued his social work career at UNC Chapel Hill. Here, he specializes in geriatrics, where he finds fulfillment in advocating for and empowering his patients. We are so excited to learn from Brian's knowledge and expertise on today's podcast. Brian, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. To get us started, can you explain what does a clinical social worker do? Absolutely. What don't we do might be a better question. It, it mm -hmm. kind of depends on the role that we're in. I think in general, when people hear clinical social worker, they're referring to a talk therapist, also called a psychotherapist. So they'll be providing mental health or behavioral health support, often in the communities, often working with lower income people, uh, but not necessarily. Actually, the majority of mental health services in this country for all people are provided by social workers. And of course, there's other roles for social workers as well. Uh, folks like me work more like case managers. So I'm associated with uh, UNC Geriatrics and I'm so full time there. And my role is to make sure that if there are any resources out there that could be helpful to our patients, that I track them down and figure out how to connect them to those resources. And if they have trouble and run into barriers, then it's my job to help solve those problems. We want to help people stay in the community, stay in their homes, you know, whatever they would like to do to uh, age as gracefully and comfortably as possible. That is incredible. Uh, can you tell me, how did you get into social work and then why did you choose to specialize in geriatrics? Yeah, I had an interesting journey. I think like a lot of us, I've changed careers a couple times in my life. You know, I got my bachelor's in English because I liked books and I figured that would be a cool major. And that was a lot of fun. And then I thought, gee, I should really make some money. That would be great. <laughs> and so I thought, well, maybe publishing. You know, I'm interested in books and, and you know, I'm good at editing and these detail oriented things. So I went to um, Emerson College and got a master's in publishing and writing. And then I realized that was not for me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I took a class on uh, uh, books and they were talking about the weight of paper. And I thought, you know, I just don't care. I really don't. I just want to get the information to people. And so I got into teaching through that role. And through my teaching, I ended up teaching a class called Cultural Diversity. And this got me really interested in uh, marginalized populations, people who uh, don't get the support they need, basically. And there's a lot of you know, very complicated societal reasons for that. And I wanted to advocate to make things better. So I figured, hey, social work would be a good way to do that. Ended up going to Philadelphia. I went to UPenn and got my master's of social work. And then from there went on to become a talk therapist. I really loved that work. It's really hard work though. I was working in North Philadelphia with some underserved populations. And after about four years, I was so burned out, I needed a change. And so I switched over to case management and I kind of stumbled upon the position at UNC. I applied and you know, I was a good match for them. I speak some Spanish and they were looking for that as well. So that was a nice in. Uh, yeah, so I had no experience in geriatrics prior to that, but you know, I'm a, I love learning. I love researching. And so I was a good fit for the, for the position. That was about a little over five years ago. And so since then, uh, we moved from Pennsylvania to North Carolina for this position. Uh, and so it was a huge change for me and my family. And I didn't know anything down here. I didn't know any of the resources. Uh, and I've spent years, you know, researching uh, things that can help seniors and putting those into guides for them that are easily digestible and meeting with them and their caregivers one-on-one -on -one to explain what's out there and help them connect with these really valuable resources. And I don't know, I, I kind of just lucked into it. I, I love working with seniors. It's absolutely fantastic. We pay a lot of lip service to respecting our elders in this culture, but I don't know if we actually do it. And so I want to help hold us accountable for that. I think people uh, are deserved some respect when they hit a certain age. <laughs> yeah, that is an incredible journey. And I'm so glad to hear that you have found work that you find incredibly meaningful and you are passionate about, and it is incredibly important. So to give our listeners some context as to why your work is so important and becoming increasingly so, I want to share a few statistics. So of the 10 million people living in North Carolina, 17% belong to the senior demographic, which is a really large proportion. This on a societal level 
will mean putting a strain on the welfare system and a strain on the sandwich generation, which is the people who are responsible for caring for both children and aging parents. On an individual level, aging can be incredibly joyful and reaching an old age is what so many of us aspire for. It means a lifetime of lived experiences and valuable memories. However, it also means increased health concerns and sometimes a loss of independence. So would you mind explaining what are some of the more common challenges you see your patients dealing with and what sort of interventions do you typically offer? Definitely. Yeah, you, you summarized it very well. Our population is aging like populations all over the world and people are needing more and more support. There was a time when we just didn't live as long as we do now. Uh, and you know, now we need more supports in order to stay. There's also this uh, a greater push to stay in your home. I think the vast majority of people want to stay in their home as long as possible. And there are ways to do that, but that can be quite challenging. So one of the first things that seniors will often find themselves having some difficulty with is what they call IADLs, the Instrumental Activities of Daily Living. And these are the things like uh, you know, managing bills and uh, making appointments and filling out forms and <laughs> sometimes other things as well, like uh, the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry, you know, all of these can become more challenging as you get older. You're not as physically able to get down on your hands and knees and scrub the toilet the way that you once did. And, you know, now that everything's online, the systems can be so confusing to use for banking and this sort of thing. So people may start to notice some challenges there. And, you know, there's some simple things you can do, like putting bills on auto pay instead of writing checks. Uh, and then there's, you know, more, more involved interventions that might be needed too, like even bringing someone into the home to help with some of these tasks. So that's commonly where we'll get started is just exploring with seniors, you know, what are some of the challenges you're starting to run into? Like, what's harder for you than it should be? And let's see if we can solve those problems because, you know, let's face it, once you hit your retirement, you don't want to be scrubbing toilets anymore. And maybe you shouldn't be, right. you know, <laughs> let, let's get someone to help you with that. I think that would be great. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of your work. And from your description, it sounds both incredibly fulfilling and emotionally charged. Um, so I would like to know when you're working with a patient, what are some of your biggest goals? Is it ensuring their health and safety? Is it helping them maintain autonomy, independence, and dignity? I, like, I can imagine sometimes it's, it's a combination of all of the above, but these can sometimes be conflicting objectives. So how do you help your patients navigate the dichotomy that can arise between simply living and living a life that they find meaningful? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's two big conflicts that I see the most in the work that I do. The one, I refer back to one of our physicians, Dr. Margaret Drickamer, who likes to talk about the balance between safety and happiness. This is a crucial balance to strike. Uh, sometimes seniors would rather someone not come into their home. I mean, I understand that. It, it, you're worried about privacy. Maybe you're even worried about them stealing. Who knows? But there's also perhaps a safety concern. And so we have to balance these two. If it's not safe to shower alone, or at least you need someone in the house in case something happens, but you also value your privacy, how can we strike a balance between the two of these? And so that's a lot of what I'll do in conjunction with the doctor, the patient, maybe even a family member or a caregiver to have that dialogue to say, you know, how can we really balance these two, this, this safety, but also happiness and to realize as well, that's really important. And kind of going along with happiness, the other piece of this is sort of what the patient wants versus what family members want, which can be the same, but are often not the same. A lot of times I hear from concerned family members that they're, they're worried about their loved one. They're afraid that they're unsafe in their home or they need more support. They're worried there could be a fall, that they could break a hip and end up in the hospital and in rehab. And, and we know there can be some negative health outcomes for things like that. These are serious and valid concerns. At the same time, a person's autonomy is also incredibly important. We live in an individualistic society that believes that in general, we all have the right to make our own choices, even bad choices. 
And that's really important to remember. We have the right to make mistakes. We have the right to choose things that are not in our own best interest just because we want them. And as long as the doctor says we have capacity, we have to respect that choice. And so some of what I'll do will also be negotiating with family members and, and patients and loved ones and caregivers to figure out how can we respect this adult's autonomy while still helping to promote some safety. And that can be complicated for sure. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought up family units because in addition to working with seniors themselves, you also work closely in supporting and interacting with family units as a whole. I recently came across the term, the invisible second patient that professionals within geriatrics use to refer to family caregivers. Can you explain to our listeners the meaning behind this term? Absolutely. And sometimes they're not even so invisible, (laughs) you know? Uh, Yeah. So the idea is, yes, the patient is our patient, right? They're coming to our doctor for medical support and they're seeing me, the social worker for their psychosocial support and resources. But at the same time, as you mentioned, there's a family unit here. Uh, None of us exist alone, even though we are an independent culture. No man is an island, right? We're all connected to other people and we need other people for support, whether we like it or not in some cases. Um, And so I think that it's just important to remember that in any senior's life, there is probably a caregiver as well. Uh, Sure, some people may have someone who's remote or relatively uninvolved, But there's probably someone else involved. Very often, in in any case, there is. Uh, Oftentimes, they're local. Sometimes they live with the person. And they're often providing a great deal of support. There's all sorts of challenges associated with this. The patient may not realize their own impairment. Maybe they have a cognitive impairment. And the brain likes to protect us against things that could hurt us. So it will tell us we have nothing wrong. And then we won't be upset. (laughs) However, that can be pretty upsetting for a caregiver who sees the impairment and knows you need help and, you know, wants to get it for you, but but can't. And so there is a a stress and a tension that's kind of inherent to the caregiver relationship in that way. But at the same time, it can also be really rewarding to connect with your loved one in a way that maybe you never have before and to be able to be that meaningful caregiver. Some people see it as their duty. Some people see it as their pleasure. But it's important to know that some people also find it exhausting. It's often not a role we signed up for, and we're often not prepared for it. There's no manual for this, just like there's no manual to raise a child, for instance. And with seniors with dementia or other cognitive impairments, it can sometimes feel like that. It's very similar. So we need to pay attention not just to the patient, but to the people that surround them. And in particular, their close family members who we often call caregivers who are providing care to make sure that they're not left to be invisible and we do attend to their needs. So when a patient comes in, our doctor, sure, will ask about the patient's medical problems, but they'll also ask about who's helping you in the home and hopefully we can talk with them and see how they're feeling. If they're feeling burned out, there's ways to get some support. We call it respite, to give caregivers a break. And that can come in many forms, from some additional home care to a day program, even something like assisted living, or there's lots of other options. So we would talk about all of those and, you know, help everyone understand that you, you're, you're, we're all human here, right? We all have limits. And all the time I see caregivers, these invisible patients, try to push past their limits and they mean well, and sometimes they can do it, and other times they crash, and sometimes they will snap at their loved one and get impatient and even cause harm unintentionally. And that's what I'm here to help identify and hopefully avoid, but problem solve if we need to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, One of the best explanations I've heard recently as to why caregiving can be so psychologically draining is because it requires such a high, almost constant level of vigilance. So being constantly on and attentive would, would be draining for anyone, regardless of how much you love or care for your relative. It is draining and these burdens are often not talked about in society. And so I really want to encourage an open dialogue about that. Um, So you you mentioned the need for respite care and getting a break for caregivers, which is incredibly important. And you also brought up burnout, which is unfortunately something that we see a lot. So can you speak to what sort of societal or structural changes you would like to see 
so that we can help alleviate some of this burnout that's happening? Absolutely. I think some of it comes from a mismatch of expectations. A lot of caregivers will assume that Medicare will pay for home care. They've heard that Medicare covers home health, and so they figure if the person needs more support, well, we'll just get the doctor to order some home care and Medicare will pay for it. And in theory, that can be true sometimes, but the reality of our culture is that Medicare is pretty strict about this sort of thing. They generally do not cover home care. They'll only cover things like skilled care, like nursing or physical therapy, but not someone to help you with daily tasks. And it's partly because of budget and partly because of culture. And it's also partly because, frankly, we don't have enough aides. There's simply not enough caregivers uh, able and willing to do this work, especially for the rates that we pay them which are often far lower than they should be. Uh, so yeah, it can be a, a, a situation where caregivers do feel burned out because a lot of the support that they kind of assumed would be there just isn't there. The other time I often see it is when people assume that a family member will step in. Oh, I'll help for now and then my brother will take them for the weekend and then it will be okay. Or maybe they'll stay with my cousin for a month or something. And then that person doesn't, want to do that or maybe you assume that they should chip in and they just don't a thousand situations can come up but they can all lead to frustration and burnout and especially if you feel like the person is in danger or in risk and you want to help them you want to protect them and they don't want the help it, it can be very frustrating i think the uh the, the hyper vigilance that you mentioned you know this always being on can certainly contribute and going along with that is often a caregiver belief that they have to do everything themselves and they're the only ones who can do it right. Even if that's true, that can be the road to burnout pretty quickly, right? So right. a lot of my work is talking with caregivers. How can we delegate some of this work? How can we give it to someone else that will be good enough, even though it's not perfect? How can we keep them safe enough <laughs> that they're happy and not in the hospital, but you know, we're also not completely burning out caregivers? Right, absolutely. That is a very difficult task. Um, and you mentioned Medicare home health coverage. I would love to learn more about that. It's my understanding that the overall objective of Medicare home health coverage um, is to improve health outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries by subsidizing access to both skilled and unskilled home health services. And just from my preliminary research, it seems like there are a number of criteria that one has to meet in order to qualify for this. Can you walk us through what those criteria are? And I know that is a very long question, but can you kind of break <laughs> it down for us? I will do my best. I'll tell you, whenever insurance gets involved, things get complicated, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So in, in general, uh, I like to distinguish between home care and home health. So home care is the one that's covered by Medicare. Home health is the one that's not. Home care will typically involve skilled care, like physical therapy and home care will typically involve what they call unskilled uh, uh, care, which could be IADL support with cooking and cleaning or activities of daily living, ADL support with things like bathing and dressing. So to just focus on home care for a moment, and I'll focus on the Medicare criteria, which many other people uh, and then companies will also use. And I will say, when in doubt, ask your doctor, because they are the, uh, the experts in doing these referrals, and they should be able to tell you if you meet these guidelines or not. But number one, the person has to be homebound. That doesn't mean they can't leave the home, but it does mean it's very difficult to leave the home. So if someone's driving, they're generally not considered homebound. The other thing is the patient has to need skilled care that can be provided intermittently in the home. And so typically this would be like a physical therapist coming two to three times a week. Uh, you can get a nurse to come out as well, but it's often not the nurse that people are thinking about. It's more about disease education, uh, showing you how to fill a pillbox correctly, maybe managing some wound dressings and things like that. And of course, you can get other services as well. And you can attach an aid to these services if the doctor includes it in the order, but it just depends on if the company can provide it or not. And even though in theory, Medicare says that it will pay for, in rare cases, up to 35 hours a week of home aid care and nursing combined, 
the reality is it's very hard to justify that as being medically uh, necessary. And so because of fear of audits and the fact that none of this is pre-authorized, it's all sort of a reimbursement-based system, a lot of companies won't offer uh, that, that aid, or they can't because they don't have the staff. So yeah, long story short, if you're feeling like home health or home care could be necessary or helpful, ask your doctor and they can uh, tell you for sure. You do need to have seen your doctor typically within the last 90 days in what they call a face-to-face -face visit in order to qualify. That can be in person or it can be a two-way video, but it cannot be a phone visit. So yeah, make an appointment with your doctor, ask them what you might qualify for, and if they're not sure, see if there's a social worker around. If for some reason the office doesn't have a social worker, you can also call your insurance, like Medicare, for example, 1-800-MEDICARE. You can also check with your local Department of Social Services. They often have some senior supports that can help provide some guidance. Yeah, this sounds like it can be a complicated process. And so I'm very glad we have people like you to help us navigate it. And it also sounds like even once you go through the steps of qualifying for Medicare home health or Medicare home care, um, you're not necessarily guaranteed to be matched with a care provider right away since you mentioned the caregiver shortage in North Carolina and around the country. So in your opinion, what is the best way to improve Medicare home health moving forward? Should we be expanding the qualifying criteria to include more people? Should we increase the available home health services that are offered through Medicare home health? What do you see as the path we need to take? Yeah, it's like if I had a magic wand and I could wave yeah. it and change <laughs> Medicare policy, what would I do? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I will I will say that things are like this by design, and uh, a lot of it is based on money, and a lot of it's based on availability. It's not just home aides that we have trouble. Sometimes we don't have enough physical therapists or enough nurses, and so we're really looking at sy some systemic issues here, and a lot of it's driven by uh, by pay, frankly, and, and financing. So. I would love to see, if I could wave my magic wand, I would say Medicare now covers home care as well as home health. And if a doctor orders it and says, you know, this person needs assistance with uh, cooking and cleaning and they need someone to run to the grocery store and grab their groceries for them and they need someone to come to their house and fill their pill box and they need someone there to remind them to take their pills. Like if the doctor can certify what's needed, I would love to have that covered by Medicare. Currently, it's not possible. Uh, Medicare doesn't have near enough money. In fact, there's there's been concern pretty much since Medicare was founded that it's like on the verge of bankruptcy. Like we see it going bankrupt just a few decades in the future. And so to this day, to this very minute, we're trying to figure out how to avert that. Uh, it doesn't help that the population is leaning towards older adults. And in some countries, it's approaching a disaster. In Japan, for example, the aging population is so significant, they have the oldest life expectancy in the world, that there's a very low birth rate and there's just not enough people working and paying into the system to take care of their needs. We're not that bad in this country, but we're getting there. And so we would need a huge push to better finance Medicare. And that would have to come from the top. I mean, from the congressional budget officer, whoever does this stuff, right. it would literally take an act of Congress to change. So write your Congress people, Tell them that you want Medicare to cover home care. I, I think that would be crucially helpful. It would help so many seniors stay in their home. It would alleviate so much caregiver burnout. And it is something that people just kind of expect. A lot of people assume they're going to do it anyway because it's just common sense. They say, oh, well, it's not medically necessary. What, you don't have to eat? I mean, you know, like, <laughs> if you have stuff all over your house, you're going to trip over it. Like, so it's not medically necessary. But there's other Medicare policies that would have to be looked at as well. Medicare does not cover anything long term. Full stop. That would have to change. Wow. Medicare does not cover most preventative things. That has to change too. <laughs> you know, what what it shocks me to learn about this. Did you know Medicare doesn't cover anything for the bathroom? I did not know that. Wow, that is nothing really at all. No raised toilet seat, no grab bars, no shower chair, nothing for the bathroom. Oh my Why? goodness. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> That's obvious. I mean, almost everyone needs that. Who knows why? 
but they won't cover it. And so we, we need to look at fundamental policies like this and financing, and it's got to come from the very top. I don't think, uh, you know, we've done our best to fill in the gaps. There are community agencies that will step in and help provide medical equipment to people who need it. And there's there was some volunteer home care for a while until they went bankrupt in the Triangle area. The people are attempting to solve these problems, but we really need it to come from the top. So yeah, your congressperson. <laughs> these sound like some pretty big flaws with the system. And I hope that we are able to see significant changes soon because there are so many people out there who would benefit from these improvements. Brian, thank you so much for being on our podcast and sharing your expertise. I have learned so much from speaking with you and I am sure that our listeners will as well. Um, I really admire and appreciate the work that you do. And again, thank you so much for sharing with us. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.